Tom, briefly off camera, you were just telling us a slogan about NASA. And I thought it relates to something that was interesting in the beginning of a space program about how you don't just do things well. It seems like you're a perfectionist and you, you insist on making sure that it's perfect. Well, when we say perfectionism, it's often described as an illness. And that might be true. But what we say in the studio is it won't fail because of me. It won't fail because of my part. This, that's, and that's a great slogan for collective work. And when we put a man on the moon, it was 35,000 people working on it. And each one of them said, my small, we might, we'll get there. If we don't get there, it's not because of something I didn't do. And if everyone really agrees and believes in that, then we can achieve these incredible things. You've said before you don't take vacations. You don't believe in them. Therefore, do you ever feel work feels stale? Because if you're totally nose to the grindstone, and you believe in making sure that every part is, every I is dotted, T crossed. How do you recharge? Uh, well, that's a, that's a great question. Stanley Kubrick never took vacations, and little is known about how he fucked off, but I, he had to, we all have to do things to regenerate ourselves. I am um, into really normal stuff like eating, going to the bathroom, <laughs> Good. Yeah. sexual intercourse. Um, sometimes I like to go surfing, weightlifting, and skateboarding. But ultimately, the, the thing when I say I don't take vacations is because I'm really fulfilled by my work. And I'm very lucky that the thing that I, that I get, that I, or I should say I'm, um, I'm extremely privileged to be able to work for passion and do the things that are important to me, um, which means that um, there's a disconnect between things that are done for money. To me, the biggest curse would be to pay, be really well paid to do something that you didn't love to do because then you'd be trapped by the abstract wealth whereas doing things for for love or for passion means it doesn't matter if you're getting paid or not that's a it's a detail very very important detail but it's it means that you can just do what you believe in and it's important to always organize life towards that the shakers had this expression um, do the job as if you had a thousand years to live, yet to die tomorrow. Well, I know people always say, like, don't turn your hobby into a job. Find the second thing that you love to do. Because once it becomes a job, then it's laborious, and then you feel somehow hindered by it. I, yeah, I disagree completely. Uh, Dean Kamen in Slingshot, which is a great documentary about uh, Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, but also the computerized insulin pump and a lot of amazing um, uh, biotech stuff said the key to success is do what you love and get so good at it that you can make a living doing it now of course half the job is doing your job what you love and the other half is bringing it to the world which is communications paying your taxes um, doing interviews um, writing and talking about it helping out educate and teach and share that's important to it's not just working by yourself in a garret, it's communicating. And, and the movies that we make, Van and I are, it's Van Neistat, and I are um, in a way communication aspects of the sculpture. They're, like, they're built like, the movies that we make are built just like sculptures, but they are, they're films. So they, have, they show the flaws, they're shot with a, a Canon T2i with a missing, um, with a missing pixel in the middle about two thirds of the way down from the top of the screen, you'll see one red dot. It's almost always there. And uh, I think we're about to get a new version, like the T8i or something, I'm not sure. Um, but I, it's the, the idea that it's, we, we started making movies when uh, iMovie came out. Because it, and then when iMovie started to become so difficult, and not functional, that's when we stop for about three years and now we're using Final Cut because it's easy again. What lenses did you use? Because you had such great intricate close-ups of drills and things like that. What did you that's the off-the-shelf um, Canon zoom lens. I don't even remember the number of it, but it's probably something like a 20 or 30 millimeter to zoom out to be somewhere between 80 and 125. It's like the basic off the shelf one. It's not even the one with a red ring on it. It's not the good one. I think we bought one of those later when we had to t 
get another T2i to take a picture of our T2i for the credit sequence in the space program. We needed, we needed a photo of the camera, so we had to buy a second one just to take a f one photo of the first one, so the which we then returned. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. so the entire film is shot on a Canon T2i? Yeah. Wow. Ba it, its name is Baby Jesus, and in this wow. credit sequence, you'll see that credit sequence is shot. Uh, you'll see the camera is in it. So there is some iPhone footage also, um, but nothing, um, there's nothing exotic. And when we shoot still photos of the sculptures, those are all shot with like a 40 Ninja Pixel a Hasselblad a digital back um, by, and those are always shot by Genevieve Hansen or Joshua White. But those are stills, and those are for the images that you'll see in books and on the websites. What was the decision to use a T2i? I mean, I, I was thinking you used maybe a red or something. I, uh, it's beautiful, it, but. It really was what, Van ha that's Van's camera, and what's important about the T2i to our team is that Van knows what all the buttons do, and a red has, um, it's a, probably a superior camera in nearly every way, except the, you, know, you have a huge liability because it's so expensive. The, the virtue of a cheap camera is that it's, 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 it's a, uh, it's not an heirloom product, it's a, it's, a, it's a consumable. Even though cameras typically aren't understood as consumables, the films, the data cards are considered consumables. But when something's that cheap, you can take risks. You, can, you, know, you, don't have to take, you don't have to obsess about it. And I think a lot of filmmakers and camera aficionados are more obsessed with the hardware than what it's capturing. And if something's only $500 and you've got a huge production ahead of you, it's really a relatively small part. And that reversal of um, economics and power is what gives us the freedom to make a movie like we did. It's a bar lowering effect. And, and also I can't underscore this enough, the knowing how to use the tool is the most important thing, not what the tool can do. As, as a sculptor, I've made s much better work with lower quality tools that were in my hands that I know that I have a muscle memory with than a more precise, better tool, just because it's part of my body. I'm not thinking. So when Van's getting these shots, he doesn't have to worry about learning about some great new feature. He just goes. And speed is one of the, uh, uh, the cornerstones of, we have sort of, 10 rules of filmmaking. Oh, please. Oh, and yeah. um, uh, rule number one is finish the movie. <laughs> That's a good rule. And most m movie makers don't follow rule number one, and most movies don't get finished. And so if you finish, if you, if you follow rule number one, that's so much more important than rules number nine through, through, um, through 10. That, and we don't always follow the other rules, but we always follow rule number one. Why do you think it's rule number one is not always, I, what's the reason for that? Let me start over again. Because is it boredom? Is it? I, I don't think it has anything to do with filmmaking. I think it's just um, a question of um, character and will and doing what it takes to get the job done. I think it's bring the ball to the net, metaphor, sports metaphor, and doing what it takes to, to, to get it in the hole, like whatever it takes. It almost, and I think when you, before you asked me about perfectionism, I, perfection, you know, the, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good or something like that. I, you know, it's, this is not a perfectionist speaking, saying get the movie done because the movie is flawed. And I think if you look at a space program, you'll see tons of flaws. There are all these things that, are, are, um, that aren't perfect about it. There are, all the individual sequences are perfect, but it's, it's, it's flawed. It's, like it's got some uh, character flaws in that it's maybe trying to do too many things, or, or maybe, it's not, maybe it's not long enough. It, should have, it would have been a perfect movie if it had been about three hours long and we'd shown every little sequence in order and made industrial films like we originally wanted to do, but I didn't feel that was watchable and that would be too alienating to the audience. And there's some great filmmakers who are perfectionists who make more perfect movies, but it was important to us to make something that people could see. Um, I love the films of avant-garde sculptors who make these 
epic movies, but they're they're really disrespectful to the viewer in that they don't make it reasonable to finish the movie. And I think we're living in a time where you have to make a choice what your expectation is of the viewer. Are you trying to um, you know, subject them to something, or are you trying to teach them something, or are you trying to share, or are you trying to help them to understand without thinking? I don't know, I think there are different kinds of movies for different kinds of roles. We are really interested in making movies that illustrate the aspects of the sculptures that exist in time. In other words, this sculpture, you know, which is maybe in a museum, at one time was, that maybe I didn't make it, let's just say it was a, a African mask, it was used in a ritual, or this, um, you know, this sword was used by a famous samurai, or this sarcophagus was something that someone was buried in, and, and all these, the, the mask, the sword, the sarcophagus, all um, had stories and events and things that occurred with them. One was for a, for a ritual, one was for a fight, one was to house a dead body. Um, all those things are things that existed in time and, and action. So a lot of the things, the sculptures, or the movies about the sculptures are to show how these sculptures had a history and part of a ritual activity that was done in the studio. We go to other planets, we explore them in our live demonstrations, and these movies show how we did that. Of those remaining uh, nine rules, which is the second most important besides number one, do you think? Well, they're all really mundane things, but they're important, and I'm not going to get them all, and I'm not going to get them right in order, but they're things like uh, uh, write the end of the movie before you start shooting. Don't try and um, start shooting without having the end of the story figured out because the third act's the hard one. You have to understand that before you even start because if you don't, you wind up like that amazing guy, um, uh, Coppola in... Hearts of Darkness. Yeah, exactly, where he's sitting in the Philippines in a trailer in the middle of the night, typing all night and shooting all the next day and not <laughs> sleeping, and that's everything falls apart. I, I think he got lucky that he got to finish that movie and it was a, although arguably his greatest film of one of the world's greatest film directors, I, I think it's lucky that it was a great film. I don't see all those all late nights being uh, the answer. I think a lot of things came together in a kind of miraculous way that's an, and that's an anomaly. So that's a situation you want to avoid. And I think that if you look at the history of his life, that was not maybe necessarily a successful feeling time. It was years later that it, right. it became, I think it was viewed potentially as, as a failure in its time and then only after a time it became one of the greats. Um, anyway, certainly an unhappy thing and that's, that's something that we're not looking to, to repeat. Um, uh, avoid camera movement. Hmm. Um, Especially with a DSLR, like a T2i. Any, any camera. It's, 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 it's whether it's a, on, a, on a DSLR or a RED or any camera. It's, uh, camera movement's a privilege. It's not a right. It's an indulgence. There's why, you, shouldn't, you should do always as little work as you can. An idea um, shouldn't be any more... Oh wait, how did, Einstein said this. I'm going to screw this up. Everything should be as simple as possible, but no more so. In other words, use a tracking shot, zoom in, but only to an effect. Or a better example maybe is omit unnecessary words, strunk and white. Um, a sculpture should be uh, as small as it can be to communicate the idea. That might mean it needs to be the size of a building in some cases, but could also fit in the palm of your hand. Everything else is just hubris and ego. 2016, filled with franchises and sequels, why should people care about a space program? <laughs> oh, <good question. laughs> no, well, no. Uh, um, we One are, word. Uh, <laughs> and homemade and you, the individual, we were here. In other words, I always wanted my sculptures to be perfect like an iPhone and I tried and once I even made a giant sculpture that was nearly perfect and but there were some flaws and those flaws really drove me crazy and uh, 
And once I kind of started to embrace those flaws, I began to understand that I could never make something as flawed, as perfect as an iPhone, but Apple could never make anything as shitty as one of my sculptures. And when I say shitty, I really mean showing the evidence of human being was there. We were at a time now where um, you can have anything you want made perfectly by robots. We're getting there. You can start to feel it. And the virtue of the handmade, the fingerprint, is, um, is being eliminated. I think that's also why you see artisanal movements. So you see rise in ceramics. Um, in fact, my ceramic bowls, when I push my finger into the clay, um, there's a fingerprint that will be there for 20,000 years after this whole building has turned to rubble and all of our computers have returned to their inert elements. Um, we're going to have a fingerprint still there in ceramic underneath all the rubble and shards. So um, there is, I, I think with this rise of robot-made stuff, you're seeing a rise of artisanal made things, slow food, homemade bicycles, knives, uh, clothes. You're even seeing people making their own cars from scratch. Um, it's in a way a reaction against it. Uh, zine culture is back as a reaction against websites, which in a website works better than a zine any time, but you don't get to hand it to someone. There's some, uh, there's some sensuality to the paper that you get to touch it. You get to burn it, wipe your ass with it, you know, write a love letter on the back of it. It's real.